Okay, we're in chapter 9, but before we get started, I'm going to do a little thing um, that's not officially part of the notes, but it will be something that helps us to understand it, so uh, it's going back to an experiment, of bino uh, well, it's binomial. Uh, five cards are going to be drawn from a standard deck with replacement, meaning we're putting it back, and we're going to count the number of aces, we're going to let x be the number of aces. Um, once you recognize this is binomial, because you're going to get a deck of cards, which I have. And you're going to shuffle, 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 and you're going to draw a card, and it's either an ace or not, and it's not. You put it back, you do that again five times, and then you're doing the same thing over and over, and you're just counting up success or failure. Um, so it's binomial. So let's note that. If, you don't, if you're writing notes, you don't have to write this. You can if you want. It's binomial. Um, whenever it's binomial, we should figure out our n, p, and q. Um, n is, we're drawing it five times, but there's the number of trials, reviewing chapter five. Uh, p is the probability of success on a single trial. Now for that, you're not worried about the five draws, you're worried about a single draw. And what's probably you get an ace on a single draw. Hey, ace. Um, it's four out of 52, which when you read, uh, well, I'll write it out. 4 out of 52. Again, this is not official notes. 0 0.0769. I'm going to leave it as 0.08. I'm going to run off things a little bit. Two places this time because we're not really working with this. All right, so there's an 8% chance of me getting an ace on a single draw. Q is 1 minus that, so 0.92. You don't actually need it when you start working and work, trying to work out your probabilities. So I want to talk about the, uh, the distribution. Um, if I ask for the distribution of x, the number of aces, you would make a whole table. I usually, we make it vertically, but I'm going to make this one. Um, hor sorry, we usually make it horizontally. I usually, we write out x. Uh, up to now, I've been kind of writing it out like that, but it doesn't matter. You're just organizing all your x's and their probabilities. I'm going to go ahead and make it vertical. I can get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5 aces. Um, I'm doing it vertically for a reason because I didn't get a chance to address um, that. Uh, there was a shortcut to finding binomial probabilities. This form is going to be um, n choose k times p to the k times q to the n minus k. Or you can use, oops, sorry, I'm in the way I think. Or I s went over one time the binomial PDF function, PDF instead of CDF for the binomial. And you would have to put an n, p, and then specify k. That's why I mentioned we don't need q. You, you, the parameters of this distribution are n and p, and the notation of it, um, which I didn't really use, but just like you have the capital N for normal, the capital T for um, the T distribution, which we just learned about. And I did mention one time they use capital B for binomial, although we didn't really use it too often. And I would put my parameters, n and p. So normally you put your mean and standard deviation, T you put your degrees of freedom, and for B binomial you put your N and then P, and that's the conventional order on it. So I'm going to do the distribution. It's discrete, meaning it's not a, it's not a, it's not a curve, um, but instead it's just a list of probabilities. A table is one way we can do it. A histogram is another way. Um, but anyway, I would like to find out all these probabilities, because I do want to talk about them as I work through this example or this completely non-example example. example. Um, I wanted to mention, uh, you can actually use your list feature to do this. That's why I'm doing it vertically. So I'm going to go ahead and in L1 put all of my possible number of aces. And I can get five aces again because I am putting, I am replacing each one. So it is possible. Not likely, but I can definitely get um, five aces because every time I draw a card, it's going to be the full deck of cards with all four aces. All right, I'll put that in L1. And in L2, I'm definitely not going to do that, although you could. I'm going to put in, I'm going to call the binomial function. And so I'm going to go to the column header, as I usually do to do a formula, but the formula is actually going to involve a function. I'm going to write binomial PDF. If you recall, it takes n, which is 5. Then P, which is 0 0.08 or 0 0.0769, but I'm going to use a rounded figure around two places. And then your K, and for the uh, distribution, you're going through all the Ks. That's K is 0, K is 1, K is 2, K is 3. So if I put K is equal to 2, it give me the, if I put 2 here, that's going to give me the probability that goes there. But I would like to do them all at once, and I can, by 
not putting a value there, but putting or referring to the values that are in L1. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And it will give me all of them, populate the entire list. All right, I'm going to do it real quick. I won't spend too much time on that because I'm actually going to do this card thingy. Uh, it's under distribution. You got to scroll though. It's like number 13. Oh no, it's uh, number A, which is like 11 ish. Five trials, 0 0.08, probably a success. Uh, and my X values, X values are what the Ks are. And I'm going to just put L1. Hit enter, hit enter again. And it gives me all these probabilities. No, they're a little bit off because of the rounded figure. Uh, okay, yeah, that's fine. 6, 8, 2, 9. Wait a minute. Sorry, 6, 6, 2, 9. Oh, 5. Uh, 1.9 times 10 to the negative 4. I'm just going to leave it like that because I do want to see how small it's getting. 3.3 .3 times 10 to the negative 6. And the 5 is so small, probably, but this is just such a small probability of. I'm getting five aces. It is possible. It's not a zero probability, but the probability is so small that it round the calculator itself round rounded it down to zero. That's going to happen in the homework in some situations. So be aware that sometimes the probabilities are so small um, that they're going to round down to zero. Okay, and then if I draw this histogram, Six seven point seven. Uh, it's going to be way up there for that. Then twenty nine. Oh, this is five, and it's already getting so small that I'm going to have to exaggerate how flat the bars are. Okay. That's my histogram. Uh, right skewed, obviously. High probability of getting zeros or ones, aces. All right, let's do this. There's my deck of cards. All right, yeah, I'm gonna do it. Not an ace. Shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Not an ace. Shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Not an ace. That's three, and I got zero aces so far. Two more. Shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Not an ace. Come on, ace. I'm actually trying for an ace. Uh, zero. I got zero. Okay. So, you know what the L? I'm going to put my notation here. This is binomial with five trials and a probability of 0 0.08. Um, I'm going to record that because I'm going to erase all of this. I'm going to note that my x equals 0. The probability of that occurring was 0.66. So there was a 66% ch chance of that happening, of me getting 0 aces. So not really a surprise there. Notice it's the blue deck, bicycle deck of cards. Your usual stuff you get from the store. Different deck, red deck. All right, let's do this again. Drawing a card five times, counting the end races I get. All right, ace, I got one. And, uh, sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it back and I'm gonna shuffle. Shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Draw okay. again. Ace again. I'm not grabbing the same mace. Look, it's I'm gonna shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Let me just shuffle it. And I'm not doing I'm not taking anything out. Hey, here we go. Shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Not an ace. So that's four draws, three aces. I could do one more. I got three aces so far. I'll shuffle it good. Here, let me do the. Let 
Last one. Okay, I gotta remove it. Not an ace. Okay, I got three. Um, and usually if I'm doing this in class, people are starting to, once I get the, like, the second one or the third one, they start to really uh, grumble, I don't want to say grumble, they start to say things to indicate that they don't think I'm doing it legitimately. Um, and maybe you conclude that, three aces, let's look at the probability of that. Um, sometimes I get four, when I do the red deck, sometimes I get four and you definitely know something's wrong. Um, but the probability of me getting three aces on five draws is... 1.9 times 10 to the negative 4 probability, that's 0 0.00019, uh, which if you round it, it'll round to 0 0.0002. Okay, blue deck, I got zero. Nobody really cares that I do. They kind of just space out and start going on their phones when I do that. But when I start getting three aces, um, everybody starts paying attention and realizes that something is going on with the red deck. Um, you start to suspect it. And the this is to illustrate that when you get something that's normal or usual or expected like zero aces is expected you get you expect to get zero or one everything seems fine and you don't believe that i was cheating with the blue deck but once i start getting these occurrences or these outcomes or events that have low probabilities like three or four aces that's way out here probably that is point zero zero two you start to suspect something is up um here you're probably with six six so nobody cared about my blue deck and getting zero aces but everybody starts to suspect something is wrong when I get three aces. Um, and mathematically what it is, is means you are disputing or you start to dispute whether these parameters are accurate, whether it is an actual deck with only four out of 52 aces. Okay, but anyway, the blue deck was legit and the red deck was stacked with aces. So yeah, that's the issue. It was at 0 0.08. But that's going to be an important thing that you intuitively, without even knowing probabilities, even if we didn't write this out and compute them all, you would intuitively start to suspect something um, when I draw three aces on five draws because you have an intuitive notion that that is an unlikely occurrence. That's important as we move on to chapter nine. I will refer to this and talk about me getting five aces even though I didn't. I'll say, remember by the time I got five aces? Uh, probably because I don't remember what I actually did. I've done this every semester for couple of years now and I can never remember what I actually got but I usually get high numbers of aces on the red deck and that's what I'm referring to when I talk about that time I got five aces okay chapter nine is on hypothesis testing and what we tested essentially there unofficially was whether these decks are legitimate decks whether they're standard decks with only four aces that was a test and it came, we concluded that the blue deck was fine and the red deck was not. That's the kind of thing we're going to be doing here. Okay, 9.1 though. What, was, what did I just write? Chapter 9. Hypothesis testing. 9.1, we're just going to go through a lot of background. In fact, the title of it is Definitions and Notations. A lot of background to this process and then when we get through that we'll do 9.2 which is hypothesis testing for proportions then 9.3 which is hypothesis testing for means so again it's got a thing for proportions and a similar analogous thing for means uh, the null hypothesis denoted H with a little zero, um, sometimes it's called H naught or H zero or um, the null hypothesis is sometimes what they call it. Represents the claimed or default value of a parameter. And to illustrate how it related to what we just did, um, that assumed value was the p is equal to 0 0.08. I, when I said it's a standard deck, which one of them wasn't, um, we assumed the claim, even though I didn't literally say, I'm claiming this is a standard deck, the claim was that that probably getting an ace was 0 0.08. 
the alternative hypothesis Oh no, sorry, I got a little point about the null that's gonna be helpful. Uh, it'll be always as a reminder, it's always written with an equal sign. Because you're claiming that that parameter is equal to something. Okay, then the alternative hypothesis. Denoted, and different books denote a different thing. Some will say H1, that's not what we're doing, but so they have H0 and H1. Um, we're going to use HA, our book uses HA A for alternative, so that'll be a little bit more helpful. Is what we attempt to show using sample data. And this will be written with either a not, e uh, sorry, a less than, a greater than, or a not equal to. It'll be a, like a contrast to it being equal to something, or it's either greater than, sorry, less than, greater than, or not equal to. So to have one of those three symbols, we'll have to decide which, based on what type of test it is. There's going to be what's called a right tail, a left tail, and a two-tailed. But uh, we'll get to that in a bit. Let's do some examples of stating the null on alternative hypotheses um, and showing the notation that they typically use. The instructions here, and I have you do a couple of these in 9.1. State the null and alternative hypotheses. Okay, and we're going to do three of them. I'm going to do one of each of these so you can see the different scenarios. And some of these we'll come back to and do the full test. But here we're just doing the first of many steps. A company claims 80% of their customers are satisfied. Companies often make bold claims, exaggerated claims about their products or their customer satisfaction. So we wish to test if the proportion say that. I'm going, to, I'm going to use more colloquial terms. The satisfaction rate is less than claimed. Mathematically, we'd say the proportion of satisfied customers is less than what they claim. Either way, there's going to be different phrasings of it, um, but you should be able to find, you should be fine interpreting it and stating the null alternative once you, once we go over the standard way of writing it. Okay, so okay, so we're going to state the null, which is denoted by HO, and the alternative, which we are calling HA. So we'll start it off like that. These tend to stack them on top of each other, even though you don't have to. Now, um, we have two parameters that we're going to be dealing with, for now at least. Proportions and means. And we're talking about the parameter, the population parameter. So you have to decide whether you're doing P or mu, the population proportion, a percentage of something, or the population mean, the average of something. Let's see what they're asking about. They're asking, they're looking at percent of satisfied customers. So this is a proportion test. So we'll go ahead and write that. I'm gonna write P is equal to 
Both of them will involve the same parameter. They're just different hypotheses about that parameter, that proportion of satisfied customers. I mentioned that the null is always written with an equal sign, and we're going to say it's equal to whatever the claim is or whatever the default value is, and they're claiming 80%. So our null hypothesis is P is equal to 0 0.80. We want to convert percents to decimal form always, especially because we're going to be plugging this into formulas, so we need always need decimal forms. 80% is 80 hundredths, which is 0 0.80. Okay. Your alternative is going to have the same parameter. I already mentioned that. It'll have the same value. The issue is now what symbol goes in there. It's not equal to. It's either we're either looking and it's what we're trying to test for. We're either testing that it's less than 0.80 or greater than 0.80 or not equal to 0.80. And you're going to figure out what that is based on looking at some keywords and figuring out what we're looking for evidence of. We are skeptical of the company and we want to test if it's less than the claim. So our alternative is that P is less than 0.80. From there, we would do our test. We're not ready for that yet, so that we're, that we're done. That's stating the null and alternative hypotheses. Mm. So that's your actual answer. You don't have to circle it, but I'm gonna circle it for my answer. Let's do another one. A company claims the average wait time for their customers is 12.5 minutes. And we could test if it's less than that or not equal to that. But usually, you know, longer waits are worse. And so a company who's prone to lying or making stuff up will probably understate their wait times. So we wish to test. And this is not our choice. This would be the problem. The problem will tell you what we wish to test. Um, if the average wait is longer than claimed. Okay, and then based on that, we're ready to state our null on our term hypotheses. Okay, we can start setting up the same way. H-O-H-A. We have to decide on the parameter. So it's a question of, is this a means or proportions? Proportions are means. Are we looking at percentages of something? or averages of something. Average wait time is 12.5. We're doing means. So your parameter that we're testing for is mu. Um, your null is always equal. It's always to equal to whatever is claimed or the default value, 12.5. That's not a percent. You are not moving the decimal. You're not converting it. So you're not making it 0.125. That's it's 12.5 minutes. No need to write the minutes, so. Okay. Our alternative, but once again, same parameter, same value, different symbol relating them. And so now we're testing whether it is, again, we have that same choice, less than, greater than, or not equal to, and it's based on what they describe in the problem. Where are we at? What do we wish to test for? If the average wait time is longer. Longer or greater or bigger than, all of that means we are looking or we're looking for evidence that the mean is greater than 12.5. And we're done. Um, we're gonna do one more. But I just want to mention that, so at this stage, the way you would actually, so you, you default to this null, you believe, basically you give the company the benefit of the doubt that they have 80% satisfied customers or their wait time is only 12.5 minutes until you have evidence to prove them wrong. And the way you're going to get evidence that may prove them wrong um, is to gather up some sample. You'd sample some of their customers and see if they're satisfied. You'd look at some of their customers waiting in line and time how long it takes them to get service. Um, and then you would do some number crunching, get some statistics, and get what's called a p-value. And then just like my aces, you will decide whether you believe the deck was a real deck of cards with only four aces, or if you believe I was cheating. And same thing, you either believe the company or you don't. You believe the company or you don't, based on the data that you gathered. Um, and we'll talk about that when we get to it. All right, last one. Of this type, at least. A long way to go for this section. 
Oh, it's my last one. Okay. Let's see. In 2011. 15.1% of the U.S. citizens were insured. We wish to test, and that's before Obama, so we wish to test if the percent of insured has changed since Obamacare went into effect. That's why I mentioned Obama. Okay. Same instructions, we're just stating the null and the alternative. It's under parameter, Prop proportions or means, proportions or means, uh, percent of insured, percentages of things, percentage of Americans or U.S. citizens who are insured. So we're doing a test on proportions. The null is what was claimed. Now, nothing was actually claimed, um, but it's, we're using the default value. So in this case, the default or what it was before. So we're comparing things to this 15.1%. We definitely want to change that to a decimal because that's a percent. Um, our alternative will be some sort of relation between P and 0.151, but again, it could be greater than, less than, or not equal to. Look for some keywords. Are we testing if it's less than, if, it, if the percent of insured decreased since Obamacare went into effect? Are we looking at if the percent of insured increased since Obamacare went into effect? Nope, neither of those has changed. So we are not even caring if it's, if it's been good or bad for the um, country. We are looking to see if it's just had an effect at all on a percent of insured. So based on that, not or has changed, not equal to. Um, that would make it a two-tailed test. Uh, that's a right-tailed test. The other one was a left-tailed test. That's based on the probabilities of what we're doing. The tail probabilities is what we're looking at, why they're called that. And I'm going to cover that later on. But for now, that's just the idea of the first step of the process just setting up your two hypotheses. And then, again, you will gather sample of U.S. citizens, see if they're insured, and then draw some conclusions about whether we think it's stayed the same or has changed. I'm going to pause it, and then we got a lot more to do. Okay, now I just have to grind out some of the other steps in the formulas we're going to be using. And then we'll do an actual example. But a lot of background before we get to that example. So again, we're just doing notation and definition. So a test statistic. It is a quantity or a statistic specifically calculated from a sample. It's implied by the word statistic, but I'll write it anyway on a sample. And used to determine if there is Phrasing we're going to be seeing a lot sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis. And so at the end of our process, we'll draw a conclusion, and that conclusion can be stated as we either reject the null, uh, this one is not going to be part of the null, but you have your null on your alternative. Um, the null is based on their claim, the, going back to the example, company's claim, and we give them the benefit of the doubt, and we're not going to sue anybody unless we have evidence otherwise. So until we have sufficient evidence that their claim is false, 
um, we'll assume they're telling the truth about their 80% customer satisfaction. But if we find out through our analysis using this that we believe our conclusion is that there's sufficient evidence that they are lying, then we'll be rejecting their claim then now and we're going to be going with the alternative. So that'll be something that we do. But for now, it's all going to be based on us analyzing a test statistic. And I'm going to give, we're going to go through both now. There's going to be one for proportions. For proportions, it's the Z test statistic, which you're going to compute by doing P hat minus P over the square root of P Q over N. You'll have to be careful about how you type it in because this one is going to involve a p hat, which is sample proportion, your population proportion p, and down below it's p and q, not p hat and q hat, so you have to be careful there. Um, you don't have to write this part down, but the idea is, well, that z, it's called z because it is an actual z score. If you recall from chapter 7, when you do your p hat, a random sample, and you can find the proportion of that, um, your mean, your distribution is p, times the square root of pq over n. That's your mean and standard deviation of this normal distribution. And so when you do your z-score formula, which we haven't done in a while, we usually take the value minus the mean, and these are not the per and this is not the symbols we're going to be using, but this is a z-score formula, the actual value. Now the value is one of these values, which is a random p hat. p hat is random, and so that's the value we're going to be finding the z-score of and we're gonna subtract the mean of the distribution, right? There's a mean of p hat. <coughs> so we're gonna be putting, subtracting p, and this is a standard deviation of this distribution, and so we're gonna be divided by that standard deviation. So it comes from, or it is a z-score formula um, with the specific parameters that's coming from your sampling distribution of p hat that we did in chapter seven. Um, but that's not that important. What's important then is you be able to compute it and know that is, since it's a z-score, it has a distribution that is a standard normal distribution. It's a z-score on your standard normal distribution. That's going to be important because we're going to be doing probabilities off of this. And you'll, we have a lot of distributions floating around now. We'll have even more in the future. And it's, people are going to ask, like, how do I know what function on the calculator, what distribution? Am I using normal? Am I using t? Am I using chi-squared? Another one that we haven't done yet. Um, you'll know, not because I'm going to answer your question, I'm obviously not because I'm not going to be around, but you'll know because it literally says here, when you do this and you're going to do your probabilities from that z, you are going to use that distribution, normal CDF on your calculator. Okay, that'll be in contrast to when you're working with means. When you're working with means, your statistic is a what's called a t-statistic. It's a t-score. You're going to get that by doing x bar minus mu. Sample mean minus population mean. So you've got two means floating around in this problem. Divided by s over the square root of n. Again, those should seem familiar because they're coming from the sampling distribution of x bar. I'm not going to draw another picture like I did for that one. Um, but note that once you get that and you're going to be doing probabilities off that, it's not normal anymore. It's t distribution. And whenever I give you the notation, I put the degrees of freedom here. And as with... Po um, Previous things that we've done, your degrees of freedom is going to be n minus 1. So you're going to be looking up df of n minus 1 there. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's it for your test statistic. That'll be step 2 in the process, and I will organize these steps once we work an example out. The p-value. of a test statistic is the probability of obtaining a value at least as extreme as the observed value. Okay, let me start uh, going through left-tailed, 
right tailed and two tail tests. And since we're going to start with proportions, I'm going to pretend, I'm going to work with the proportions, but the same thing will apply to means. So you have your null on your alternative. P is equal to some value on our example is 0.80 because the company claimed 80% satisfaction. And then we tested if it was less than that. And what we're going to do is compute the Z statistic. That'll be on your standard normal curve. And then we'll get a, so we'll get the Z. And then the p-value that we're going to be looking for here um, is a probability of getting something at least as extreme. And since we're doing testing that's less than, at least as extreme is everything this way. What's the probability of getting something like that or below? And so your p-value is going to be that left tail probability. Hence the term left tail. All right. Um, now I'll go ahead and, so this is N01. Uh, I'll go ahead and switch it up here, but it, you can do a P as well, but let me switch it up and say this, let's say this is means, and we're going to do the one, the average wait time was 12.5, and we wanted to test if it was greater than, this time, it would be a T distribution, because you're going to be computing the T statistic for proportion, uh, sorry, for means, you'll get a T, let's say it's here, and the problem, the p-value is you're probably getting something at least extreme. And since we're looking at the greater than, extreme is this way, extremely high, extremely high wait time. So it's probably getting more than what we got. Um, so that's going to be a right tail probability that we're going to be looking at for our p-value. Okay, but again, this could be proportions, and if it was, it would, this would be an n01. That could be means, and this would be a t distribution, but... The idea here is I'm emphasizing p-values are literally the left tail or the right tail, depending if you're testing if it's less than or testing if it's greater than. Last one. Two-tailed is when you're testing if it's not equal to. We did 15.1% insured, and is it, has it changed after Obamacare? And you're going to be looking at your distribution. This one will be the N01 because it's um, proportions and we'll be computing the Z statistic. And so I could get something low, I could get something high, and let's say I got something low by sheer coincidence. Um, you want the p-value is probably getting something at least as extreme. Left tail is extreme in the left direction, right tail is extreme in the right direction. Here it's extreme in either direction. So what we would do is we would find that tail probability of getting something that extremely low and combine it with probably getting something that's equally high in the other direction. So our p-value, we both those tails combined. So we will have to be conscious of that when we know we're doing a two-tail test because we're testing if it's changed or it's different from, and then we will have to do normal CDF in this case on the left tail using negative infinity to whatever z-score we got, and then multiply it by two to double it. So we'll have to double a tail probability for a two-tail test, that's going to be something we have to worry about. Okay, and what this is going to represent is the probability of me getting however many aces. So when that's, um, this is not part of it, but I'll write it anyway. So the probability of me getting zero aces, going back to my aces experiment, was 0.66, I think, 66% chance. And when that's high, you believe that deck was fair. And when I did the red deck and I got three, my probability was uh, 0 0.0002, so small that you started to suspect that my red deck ace draw thing was not legitimate. And same idea here, when the p-value is small, you start to not believe that things are on the up and up. Um, so 66%, you believe me, you trusted me, 0 0.0002, you did not believe me, you thought I was cheating with the deck. And you were right. What's the cutoff? When did you... This is you're calling BS. This is you're okay with that. Where's the cutoff? When do you start accusing me of cheating? There has to be some sort of a cutoff. And that is called the significance level. Significance level. 
denoted by alpha. We've seen it before. It's a little fish Greek symbol. Um, it is the same alpha. It's related to those alphas that we see in the confidence interval form, those alpha over two. Um, we're not going to connect it here. We won't ever connect it, but it is connected. Is the cutoff probability? for rejecting the null, which I'm just gonna, a lot of times I'll start referring to the HO, but so you'll have to get used to that being the null. We're gonna reject the null if it's below that cutoff. So the cutoff here, according to what we're doing, well, the cutoff changes, but it's oftentimes 0 0.05, 5% cutoff, that's a common one. And that means any percent, that any number of aces that I get that has a probability of below that, you're gonna call me out. Um, but if it's above that, you're going to be fine and you're going to let it slide and give me the benefit of the doubt. So that's an important thing. Small p-values are evidence that they're lying or somebody's cheating or something. I'll sum that up right now. Uh, when you're, and I, whenever I uh, start abbreviating p-value, I will have to put p-val at the very least because that's different from p, your population proportion. It's going to be a p hat. So I can't just put p as a p value. It's going to be confusing. I'll put p value if I want to be lazy. And I'm sure I'll be lazy. When your p value is small, like my three aces, 0 0.0002, less than 5%, um, you reject the null. So in my, and that's not a formal test, but if we applied it here, the 5% cutoff the point zero 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 two me getting three aces was smaller than that, and therefore you rejected my claim that that was a standard deck with only four aces. If the p-value is greater than alpha, like the six six, um, you never say you accept it. You never say you believe somebody. You just say you're not rejecting their claim. You have no evidence to accuse them of lying. That's different from saying you believe them. So they're very careful about that. They never say something is safe and does not cause cancer. Um, they just say there's no evidence that it causes cancer. So they're very particular and careful about their wording when they report these things, and we're supposed to as well. We're not gonna say we accept the null. We'll just say we don't reject it. There's insufficient evidence to reject it. So we'll be careful about the wording. Again, we'll get to examples, but just be aware that we're gonna reject or not reject. Oh, and uh, regarding this, so 0 0.05 significance level, if we were using that in my ace thing, um, when I got zero aces, 6-6, six, six, nah, that's, that's well above it, and I'm, we're comfortable just believing that the blue deck was fair. So that's the idea, just comparing probabilities. At the end of this process, um, you could be wrong in your conclusion. You could have rejected me and said the blue deck was me cheating, sorry, the red deck was me cheating, Maybe you're wrong, maybe that red deck was fair. You believed the blue deck was fair, maybe I had a bunch of aces there and you didn't know and it was not a fair deck. So your conclusions at the end of this can always be in error. But there's two different types of errors that we can make. And they're unfortunately just called type one, type two. They don't really have um, specific names. A type one error occurs when we reject a null, when the null was in fact true, we rejected something that was true. A type two error occurs when we do not reject a null, but we should have. So when we do not reject a null, when HO was false. And those are the definitions of those. Um, I do have them summarized on your formula sheet in a little table. Let me go ahead and put the table up here and spend a little time just trying to grapple with an understanding of it. 
um, the table breaks down into possibilities. HO could be possibly true, HO could be possibly be false. A lot of times you never really know whether it is true or false, and your identification of errors are just purely hypothetical. You might have made a type 1 error in this situation. You might have made a type 2 error in this other situation. You technically will never know in real life. Okay, you could reject the null, or you could not reject. You'll see this on your formula sheet, so I'm writing it small because I just want to refer to it, but you look at your formula sheet, it's in the bottom. Okay, can you see that? Uh, yeah, you're good. Okay, and I'm going to fill it in with these definitions, but note there's four boxes because you could have made the correct decision. That is a possibility as well. Um, so type one error occurs when we reject the null, but it was, and it was true. This is type one right here. And these Roman numerals, you don't have to, I don't care if you do. Okay, type two, occur, type two error occurs when we do not reject the null, when it was in fact false. That's type two right there. The other two boxes are the correct decision. If H was false, that means they were lying and you reject their claim, that's a correct decision. On your table, on your formula sheet, it says no error. Well, it's no error or the correct decision or the correct conclusion you made. Same thing here. If H was true and you chose not to reject it, that means you kind of believe them and you were right to believe them. So that's also a no error. So when we do get to the situations where I ask you about what type of error occurred, um, and it's always multiple choice, it'll remind you of your choices. And it'll remind you of three choices. You gotta be type one, type two, and always an option for that question of what type of error occurred is an option that no error occurred. You made the correct decision. Okay, and that's it for, that's, that's a background, that'll be the conclusion. We'll draw a conclusion here on whether we believe them or not. That's the hypothesis test. We will talk about hypothetically the type of errors we could have made in that. Type one, type two, that'll usually be a follow-up question. Um, so we're done with the definitions and notation. We're gonna work through an example now. Um, let me talk about this table. Um, I tried different analogies and the one that resonated was my girlfriend cheating. Um, so H was true or H was false. It's my girlfriend. She's either faithful to me or she's cheating on me. And then I'm either literally rejecting her and dumping her, or I do not reject her and I stay with her. Um, sometimes I made the correct decision, sometimes I made the wrong decision. Uh, so if she's faithful to me, but for some reason I'm just super jealous and paranoid and I reject her, I've definitely made an error, and that's a type one, me rejecting a faithful girlfriend. Um, if she's faithful and I stay with her, I do not reject her, and I stay with her, that's a correct decision. She was loyal to me. H was false. She's a cheater. Dating a cheater. Um, if I reject her, that's a correct decision. I should definitely, you know, break up with her. Um, but if she's cheating and I don't reject her and I stay with her, I made a type 2 error and I'm staying with a cheater. Um, anyway, that's one of the many analogies. And, no, my girlfriend is nice. Uh, but anyway... Um, I'm going to pause it here and we're going to start working on an example in a little bit on all of this and get a better feel for it in a, I don't want to say real life, but a fictional scenario that's based on real life um, testing. Okay, let's do an example where we go through all of the things that we just covered. What we're doing now is sort of, it's already, we're already doing 9.2 stuff. We're actually going to do one of these tests for proportions. A company claims, and I'm going to use the same example, but we're going to work through the entire thing. A company claims that 80% of their customers are satisfied. Uh, we wish to test, same thing, if they are overstating their satisfaction rate. We wish to test. Whether the true proportion of satisfied customers, and in the future I might just say satisfaction rate for short. This is more of a mathematical, formal way of saying it. 
true proportion of uh, satisfied customers or customers that are satisfied. is under or is what did I word it less than their claim is less than claimed under the 80 percent okay uh, there's not enough information um, okay so the way we would test it is to take a sample of customers um, in a okay so here we go in a survey of a random sample of, we're going to keep it in nice round numbers, 20 customers. 15 were satisfied. So that's how we're going to draw our conclusion is just, just sample some of their customers, see who's satisfied, and then compare it to the 80% and look at some probability. We're not just going to compare it and say if it's less than that, we're going to call them out because if it's like 79% satisfaction, eh, eh, you know, I mean, there's some variation to be expected in a random sample of 20. So we don't expect to get exactly 80% satisfied. But if their claim is true, we should get something close to 80%, not too far below. Okay. Um, we technically don't have the significance level. Um, sometimes I'll mention it up front, and then some, I'm going to bring it up later um, as we go through this. Um, and then we're going to go in part. So here, uh, I'm going to walk, we're going to go through um, individual problems that are part of the whole process. So A will be to state the null and alternative hypotheses. And I'm not going to label it A. I'm going to label it, because uh, I'm going to use this later, Roman numeral 1, lowercase Roman numeral 1, um, state the null and alternative hypothesis, or hypotheses, technically, that's, wait, what did I just write? God damn it. Alternative hypotheses with an ES is plural for hypothesis. Okay. We did this earlier, but again, let's go through it. Null is denoted by HO, alternative by HA. And uh, we got to decide, are we doing proportions or means? Proportions or means? Are we doing percentages of things or averages of things? Percentages of satisfied customers, PP. Um, null is equal to the default or claim the value, 80%. The alternative is based on what we are testing. We wish to test whether the percentage is less than their claim. So we are looking for evidence that P is less than the claimed 0.80. And that's step one. Uh, step two, or number two in the process, calculate the test statistic. Oh, I should have wrote it down on my board over here, but basically you have two of them. You're gonna go to your formula sheet. You're gonna have, uh, don't write this down because I'm gonna write what you're gonna see. You're going to have this one, the Z one, under hypothesis testing. And it's going to say that. Um, and then your next to it's going to have T. And then you just have to recognize, again, going back to whether we're doing proportions or means. The one with P's and P hats is one for proportions. The one with X bars and means is the one for means. So we're doing this one, the proportions one, the Z statistic. So I'm going to erase that, and I'm also going to note that what we need, so I'm going to erase this and make some room for me to organize what we need. So look at all those pieces that we need, and before I start plugging it in, and let me write it up here. but you guys should have it in front of you, hopefully. All right, I need P, Q, no, it's P hat. P, Q, the door doesn't matter. I'm, just making, I'm trying to go in the order that I see it on there. Okay, those are, that's what we need. Um, P hat, 
So you, now you got to distinguish between, you got to make sure you understand the distinction between P and P hat. P hat is your sample proportion, your percentage of your sample of 20 that were satisfied. We got to compute it. Sometimes they give it to us, sometimes they give us numbers of satisfied customers, and we have to literally just get our calculator out and do 15 divided by 20. Oh, I know what that is. It's 0.75. That's 75% of our sample is satisfied. P is the population proportion, the proportion of all their customers that are satisfied. We don't know that technically, but when we do this process, we assume that the null is true and therefore we assume that the claim that they made is true. So we're gonna do all our computations assuming that the percentage of all their satisfied customers is 0.80. And then Q that we need there, be aware it's not Q hat. B, do not do one minus 0.75, it is Q is one minus P. Um, which is going to be 0.20. So be careful about that. Look for the hats, and that one does not have a hat. N is our sample of 20. Okay, I'm ready to put it in my calculator here. Z is equal to um, P hat minus P divided by the square root of P Q. I don't want to put in the zeros divided by 20. We have to be careful about how we type this in, so let's talk about this. But once I compute it, that's my, that's the, the test statistic. Okay, so you have to be careful when you type it in, not to just put, I'm gonna do it all one shot, and I recommend you do it in one step. Um, I'm gonna put, I'm not even gonna put the zero when I type it in. I'm gonna do 0.75 minus 0.80, that's the numerator. I don't wanna just do divide by the square root because then it's gonna do the division before the subtraction. And the way it's written, I need to subtract those first and then divide by that result. So I will need to use parentheses there. Then when you get to your square root, as usual, even though I write little individual parentheses within there, there's no point in you doing it. If your roof extends, just make sure it's all crammed in there without any parentheses. If you have the older versions, which gives you a square root symbol with an open parentheses for the opening of the square root, you close up the square root with a closed parentheses and don't put any other parentheses in there because there's no point. 0.80 times 0.20 divided by 20. And let's do this together. Make sure you do this. Our computations are getting more and more. They're not bad, but they are prone to errors if you're not conscious of uh, order of operations. Okay, and I got negative 0.559. That is my Z statistic. That is my answer for part two. Uh, hold on, I gotta answer our text. Okay, I gotta erase. Mm. Okay, I might erase and just summarize what we did here eventually because I'll need this space possibly. I might be okay. Eh, well, I'll wait and see if I need the space. Okay, moving on. I got my Z statistic. What does that mean? Oh, well, we'll learn what it means, but we're not ready for that yet. Uh, three. Calculate the p value of the test statistic of that z. They're talking about that z has a p-value associated with it. Um, it's a probability. P-value is a tail probability. It, um, one of the tails, left tail, right tail, or two tail. Uh, I have to know what distribution we're working with. And how do I know that? It's z, but also on your formula it tells you that that z has a standard normal distribution. This is on your sheet, so there should be no question about what you're using for your p-value. We are using normal CDF with mean zero and standard deviation one. I'm gonna draw it out in fact, because this is just your standard normal curve and that Z statistic is literally a Z score related to the satisfaction rate of this sample. So zero is there, I don't, you don't have to draw it, but negative 0.559 is slightly to the left. 
there's negative one, there's negative two, and there's negative three, so I would say about here-ish. And my p-value is, which way am I going? I don't go left because it's on the left. I don't go right necessarily. What I need to look at is that that's a direction. We're looking if it's less than, um, so it is a left tail test. Okay, that's our p-value right there. I don't have it yet, but now I have a visual idea of what I'm trying to do. And what I'm trying to do is use normal CDF to get this region. And that's why we did chapter 6, and we spent so much time just grinding those out. My lower bound is negative infinity. My upper bound is that statistic that I just found, negative 0.59. Uh, my mean and standard deviation, don't be trying to do anything else because this is a z-score and it even says it over there or over here that it has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So we're going to go ahead and do that. And that'll be this tail probability and that is called my p-value. Negative 10 to the 99. Uh, negative 0.559. Make sure you're using the negative button, not the minus sign. 0 and 1, I'm good. 0 0.2881. Oh, sorry, this is my p valve. Now, this is a probability. And in the past, I've been saying probabilities round to four places as standard, so I would technically go round there, which is fine. But uh, we're going to be just using it for a comparison. It's not my, I mean, technically it's an answer. So you can do three places at, um, on this if you want. I'm going to be start doing that. I don't need that extra precision because I'm only, I'm only going to be doing one thing with this. And that is for the next step, drawing my conclusion. Roman numeral four. Now this one I got to write out. Uh, well, the step is I'm calling it a conclusion or your decision. And I'll write it out as a question. Is there sufficient evidence? And for that, I need to know what the standard of evidence is, which I have not mentioned. I did not mention the problem, so I, I'm going to have to give it to you here. At the 5% significance level, to conclude, satisfaction rate is lower than claimed. Ooh, I do need that room. But I'm almost done. I could probably cram it in there, but I don't really want to. I don't, this is all just, I won't be referring to this definitely. So let me just move this up. Okay, so all I have to do is, and again, what I'm doing is comparing my p-value for this conclusion, p-value and my alpha. My p-value is 0 0.288. My alpha significance level is the 5% significance level that has to be mentioned for you to make a conclusion. We have to know the cutoff, and the cutoff is 0 0.05. That's 5%. Make sure you don't use 0.5 or 0 0.005. That's 5%. And I want to see the relationship between two, which one is smaller. And that's why I only need three places. You don't want to do two because if you have like 051, let's say, you can tell that is bigger than 05. Um, but if you round it off to just two places, then you can't tell because you can't get an exact situation. You, sh you should avoid that by just making sure you have at least three. Five, three would be greater than that. 4, 9 would be less than that, but if you run it to two places, you're going to lose that information. And um, So three places is sufficient. Don't look at 288 versus 5. you got to know that sometimes it helps you to like add a zero. It's 50,000 versus 288. Probably better to think of percents. I don't know when I add that zero. I want to say 5%, and that is 28.8%. For sure, that is bigger. The mouth eats a bigger one. But you have to remember what that means, and we're going to talk about it and try to get you a feel for it. But for now, 
you can just look at that rule that I gave you. When the p-value is greater, that means you do not reject. That's our conclusion, and that means the null is that we believe their claim, and the alternative is that we reject their claim, we think they're lying, and that their satisfaction is less. So they're telling the truth, they're lying. Um, and we're not rejecting. We default to believing them and giving them the benefit of the doubt until we have evidence to reject their claim. We do not have enough evidence. This is insufficient. So we believe them. Or I want to, well, I'm going to write believe them to keep it simple, but essentially we are giving them the benefit of the doubt. Um, it's not enough evidence. And the reason it's not enough, oh, I did erase something that I need, is because the p hat that we came out with is 0.75. That is less than their claim, but it's not that much less. So based on just the randomness of it, that's a pretty reasonable thing to get for a company that does really have a 80% satisfaction rate. Um, occasionally you'll get a sample of slightly unhappy customers that will be slightly below the percentage that they claim. It doesn't mean they're lying, it just means that we got a bad a sample of um, pissy people. Okay, um, let me see, okay. We're gonna do another one. And again, this is 9.2 work that we're doing, but I'm using it because I'm gonna like elaborate on it once I get the next example down. Um, all right. So when we get to 9.2, it's gonna be kind of a breeze because we've done most of it here. Let's see. A company claims 80% of their, and we're doing the same thing. The company claims that 80% of their customers are satisfied. I'm going to word it differently though. Here I'm just going to just jump in. Is there sufficient evidence? So I'm not going to go step by step. You st we still need to go step by step, but I won't be walking you through the steps with part A, part B, part C, part D. Is there sufficient evidence? at the 5% significance level. Oh, I forgot to mention it, I'll mention it now. Uh, there are standard significance levels that they use, the most common being 5%, um, but there's 10% is a common one, and 1%, at least for our stats textbook. So when we get to 9.2, you'll see a mixed up. We'll do a couple of different ones here. I'm just sticking with the, the most common one, 5% significance level. But again, 10% and 1% you also see. They don't really do weird ones, so I'll, I'll stick with that. Uh, to conclude, the satisfaction rate is less than claimed. If a random sample of 20 customers have 12 that are satisfied. Okay, so all the information that we need is in this problem. Did I word it correctly? Well, kind of a long run on sentence, but you get the idea. Okay. It's the same thing as last time. Their claim is 80%. Um, we're testing if it's less than. We're doing it at the 5% significance level. The only difference is now when 12 of the 20. We have a different sample, and they are much less happy. I don't say much. They're less happy than the 15 out of 20 that were satisfied in the last sample. So we're redoing it with different data, a new data set. Okay. And they didn't walk us through it, so we, but we still have to do step one fly through this a little bit quicker until we get to the thing that's different. Uh, P is equal to 80. We are still testing less than. P is less than 80. We have to compute the test statistic. I'm going to organize what I have, what I need.
Okay, so once again, P hat is based on our sample and it's a different sample with a different number of satisfied customers. P is your population proportion, the percentage of all customers that are satisfied. We're gonna assume it's what they claim. They claim that it's 80% of all their customers are satisfied. We will do our computations with that and figure out some probabilities related to their claim. Um, then we get still a sample of 20, different sample of 20, but still your sample size is still 20, but 12, 12 are satisfied. 12 divided by 20 is 60%. Last time we were testing if it's less than 80% and we got 75 and that wasn't enough evidence. This is slightly stronger evidence that they might be lying because now you, the sample came up with 60%. But we got to grind it out and get a p-value to draw that conclusion. So we need that statistic. What am I going to do it? Doing that formula now. The only thing that's changing is that, so it's 0 0.60 minus 0.80 over square root of 0.80 times 0.20 divided by 20. I'll relate these percentages and draw some pictures so we understand a little bit better. For now, I just want to make sure we can get through the process and you understand the four steps. Uh, Make sure you're using parentheses on the numerator. Parentheses, 0 0.60 minus 0 0.80. Close it. Divide by one big square root with all of that crap crammed under the square root. Okay, and I got negative 2.236. Uh, I'm circling it even though that's not my final answer. My final answer will be, do we have sufficient evidence or not? But that's one of the pieces that we'll need to get there. I'm going to just go here. Okay. Next step would be the p-value step. I just did a z-statistic. If I'm confused about what I'm doing with that, I should look over here and note that it's a normal, it has a normal distribution. Last time it was negative 0.559. This time it's negative 2.236. That's further out to the right. Sorry, that's further out to the left. p-value, uh, what is it, the left tail? Make sure you pause. Yes, we're testing if it's less than. So our p-value with the tail, the probably that's less than that z-score, that statistic. All right, it's normal CDF again. Standard normal, so negative 10 to the 99 is my lower. My z-statistic is my upper, and zero and one are my parameters. And that is my p-value, let me label that. I got 0 0.0127, but I'll round it off to three places. So I can think of it as a percentage. That's 1.3%. And then my conclusion. So that's step three. That's the end of step three, finding the p-value. Step four, drawing my conclusion. Um, the significance level I would need is was buried in the original problem this time. Uh, so I'm doing, I'll label it, p-val, alpha, doesn't matter which side you put it on as long as you know what to do when your p-value is less than your significance level. That's evidence that they're lying. And I'll, I'll flesh that out in a little bit, but according to the rules, when their p-value is smaller than your significance level, you are rejecting the null. And what that means is we do not believe them. We think they're lying. So there is sufficient evidence to sue them for false advertising. Sufficient evidence their claim is bullshit. Specifically, there's sufficient evidence that their satisfaction rate is less than what they claim, 80%. Can you see that? Oh, I don't have my iPad. Hopefully you can see that. Mm. Sufficient evidence that their satisfaction rate is less than, I didn't even write rate is less than 80%. Anyway, that's what we're rejecting is thinking, believing, or coming to the conclusion that the, the actual satisfaction rate is less than their claim. We are rejecting the null, which means we're essentially we're going with the alternative, although we don't say we accept anything. We just reject their claim, 
and we have sufficient evidence that it is less than 80%. Okay, and that's the whole process again, and then now let's talk about some details about this. Give me a second. Okay. Uh, I'm going to summarize those two results, make sure we understand how, we, how it's giving us these conclusions. I'll be honest, sometimes in some stats classes, students just learn how to grind this out and memorize the rules and don't really understand how all of this is leading us to our conclusions. And you can, you just memorize and you reject when the p-value is smaller than alpha, you don't reject when it does, and you don't even have to know what that means if you want to just grind it out. But uh, I'd like you to understand, so I'm going to take some time um, talking about it. Okay, so this is for p-hat is equal to 75. Um, from our first one, where n, these are both n is equal to 20. I'll write that in. So sample size of 20, and the first time I'm, go, I'm going back to the two examples. Um, the first time we had a p hat, 75% of the sample was satisfied. Now, p hat is a random thing. In fact, we saw two different p hats coming from two different samples of size 20. Um, the distribution of p hat when you take a sample of 20. And keep in mind, we are assuming that we're drawing from a population that has 80% satisfaction. We assume the company was telling the truth the whole way until the end. So I can do what we did in chapter 7, which is do p hat has a distribution that is normal with mean p, square root of p, q over n, and use their claim of 80% and a sample size that we decided on a 20. Anyway, I did it for you. You can relax. But that's the distribution there. It's normal with mean 0.80 and 0.089. Um, that's the distribution of p hat, meaning that it should tend towards 80. It could be a little bit more than that. It could be a little bit less than that. But it shouldn't be too far below, and it shouldn't be too far above. Um, all right. And we are not actually looking at that when we do our process. You could sometimes in some context they do look at that data but we just go straight to a z score so we translate it automatically to normal cdf okay i'm not gonna put all the marks there but you know how to do that okay but i want to talk about what we got when we had a p hat of 0.75 that's about here-ish 70 percent satisfaction and because that was close enough to 80 percent the probability that we would get by the probably that by random chance we would take a sample of 20 drawn from a population where 80% are satisfied, the probability that we will get 75% satisfaction or below is 288, was it? Yeah. Like 29% probability. And that's like me getting one ace on five draws. Um, it's not, not unusual. It's pretty reasonable, pretty plausible that that could happen. Um, we didn't actually look at that though. What we did was we took that 0.75 and these parameters and found the z-score. We literally did z is equal to that value we're trying to find it minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. That's what that formula does over there. So we just went straight to the standard normal curve and found the z-score of that was negative 0.559. And then we looked at this tail probability using normal CDF and that's how we found it is 0.288. But it's the same p-value on either thing. It's, that's a probability, there's a 29% chance that we would get a satisfaction rate of 75% or below for a random sample of 20 if they're telling the truth. And that's like me, again, getting one ace. It's not that bad, it's pretty reasonable. Nothing, no reason to suspect the company was lying. Then some other person did a sample of 20, or maybe we did it again with a different random sample of 20, and this time we had a satisfaction of 0.60. Now, we did the test again, which means that we assumed they were telling the truth and 80% satisfaction. Um, it's still a sample of 20, and that's the only thing that determines the standard deviation, that and the n. And so we expect to get Again, we expect to get something close to 80, not too far below and not too far above. But we got 60% satisfaction, and that seems like it's, it's more unusual than 75. It's, too, it's further out, so it's less likely to get that result. And that's similar to me getting three aces 
on the five card draw. It starts to get suspicious. Um, how suspicious? Well, there was only 1.3% chance that that would get occur by random chance. So because it's such a small probability of it occurring by random chance, we're starting to suspect it's not random chance. We're starting to sus sus suspect the company is lying. Uh, we're starting to not believe that 80% claim. Here, it seemed reasonable. Here, now nah, you wouldn't get that. It's a 1.3% chance you would get that. So that's why it's suspicious. Again, we did not actually look at that distribution. We took that 0.60 and immediately converted it to a z-score on your standard normal curve. And what was it again? Negative 2.236. And then use that within the standard normal curve to find our p-value. But it's identical if we had done it over there. Okay, and so that's suspicious and that's why. So they claim 80%. And when you get, and if you took a sample and 80% of your sample was satisfied, that would be a z-score of zero, which means dead on exactly what we would expect. If we got slightly less, um, that's fine. It's still probably just due to random chance. It's somewhat less, we're starting to get skeptical. And when it starts to get further and further away, eventually when that falls below 5%, that's the cutoff to when we decide we're going to sue these people for false advertising. We're not going to really assume, them, but that's the idea. That's a cutoff for when we don't believe them. Reasonable, we still believe them. Not reasonable at all. This, no way. So we're calling them out in this situation. Um, I'm going to do a couple more of this, this overview, some more fleshing it out, but I've got to erase this and make more of these. Mm, do I? Yeah. Okay. Oh, wait, before I erase this. So... <clears throat> You don't reject, you believe them, you reject, you believe them. There's some cutoff here where it's going to move from do not reject to reject, and that's called a critical value, which is a term that's used a lot in different contexts. It's, it's all similar. They're like a z-score or a t-score um, that cuts off certain percentages, specific percentages. So we're going to look at that next. Mm, we'll look at it now, I guess. And then I'm going to have some follow-up questions related to the same thing. So I'm still going to work with the same company claiming 80% satisfaction. But what I'm going to do is we're going to work, pretend that we're working before we even take a sample. So we're going to take two more samples of 20 and look at percentages. Uh, here is my N.80 and 0.089. And here's my standard normal curve. Okay, and since that critical value that I just mentioned um, is where the percentage, anything to the left of that, the percentage will be low, below 5%. Anything on this side, your percentage will be above 5%. So that critical value is where you have exactly 5%. And we can compute that. So for a 5% significant level, it's different if it's 10%, we've got to worry about 10% or 1%, um, but here's going to be 5%. But this is your critical value. It's just a z-score that has 5% to the left. And I can find that using inverse norm. So I'm going to do that right now. I think I know what I... Uh, what is that? That's so 1.6451, right? Let's just do it. Inverse norm, 0 0.05. Inverse norm takes the area to the left. Let me just type that in. And I got one, well, I got negative 1.64, yeah, the negative is actually relevant. Negative 1.645 here. Okay, so that's literally the z-score that cuts off 5% probability to the left. Uh, okay, and then if I translate it up here, so I got to go backwards. I use inverse norm to figure out what that z-score is, and then I can go backwards there. In a way, we didn't really emphasize, so I'm not going to go through it, but I do need to look it up, or no, I can do it right now. Okay, and that cutoff here is 0.654. And keep in mind what that is, or what distribution is on. It's the distribution of P hat satisfied customers with 80% in the middle. And that's the value that, that's a percentage of satisfied customers corresponding to exactly 5% P value. So, going back to what we just did, any value, any any p hat that's to the left of this means we reject. 
Similarly, any z scores to the left of this we reject because that means your p value is going to be smaller than 5%. Any p hat that's to the right, um, that means you're not going to reject because your p value will be bigger than 0 0.05. So going back through what we did, and then I'm going to give you some new questions. Okay, should we, so the question is going to be, should we reject if the sample size is 20, we're still we're not going to change that up, we're still working with a sample size of 20, and p hat is, okay, and I'm going to go through a couple, uh, p hat, and I'm going to give you z scores as well, so we're, we're going to go through the, um, the previous ones, um, if I had a p hat of 0 0.75, which led to a z score of negative 0.559. Um, and what I did with that D score, if you recall, is use normal CDF and get an actual p-value, get that tail probability. But now, without doing that, if I know the critical values, this is a, just a different way of doing it. I, I don't have to do the actual p-value. I can just look at that, glance at that 0.75, know that's here. Or, I can make my conclusion out, or I could look at the Z score, negative 0.559, and know that is, uh, I should move this, hold on. And now negative 0.559 is to the right of that. And purely based on that, I know when I do my p-value, I don't want to shake a little on this, my picture. My p-value is going to be a percentage that's bigger than 0 0.05. Same thing here, my p-value will be bigger than 0 0.05. So I can tell right now I'm not going to reject, which is what we did. But here, because I have those critical values, I can, I don't even have to go to the p-value step. I don't have to compute a p-value. I can tell if it, I'm going to reject or not reject. Okay, let me erase because I'm going to do a bunch of these. Not just one, that, not just the two that we did, but I'm going to throw in two additional samples. Uh, let me call this A. So that was our first test that we did. We're looking at it in a different way now. Now that we have that, it's going to be way more convenient. Uh, second one, sample size of 20, 12 are satisfied. That's the second test that we did. Um, about 60% satisfaction rate. We had a z-score of negative 2.236, was it? Yep. Okay, should we reject based on that? Uh, again, what we did was compute the actual p-value and compare it to 0.05, but I don't have to do that because I can literally see which side it's on and conclude the p-value is going to be smaller because 0.60 is going to be here. So my p-value is going to be definitely less than 0.05. Oops, I forgot to label this. So. That blue is 0 0.05, and when I mark 0 0.60 there and do a p-value, I can get the actual value by using normal CDF, but I can definitely tell it's going to be under 0 0.05, and same thing here if I have a z-score of negative 2.236, I can just tell my p-value is going to be less than 0 0.05, so I can tell that I'm going to reject in that, those instances. Okay, That's what we did already, and because of that, because we're going to reject when it's to the left, they will call that the rejection region. That's we're going to do some more now. C, a p hat of 0 0.70. And you could take that, plug it into this formula, get a z score, but I've done it for you. I don't want to waste time with that. But, oops, this will have a z score when you plug it into this of negative 1.18. Sorry, negative 1.118. Are we going to reject based on that? I could find a p-value on that and use that, but I can also see if it's in the rejection region. Is it? 
Uh, I can look at this one if I have it. 0.70 is to the right. Nope, my p-value will be bigger than 0 0.05. I can look at this. Negative 0.1, negative 1.118 will be about there. Nope, I'm not going to reject. That's not enough evidence. Last one, 50% satisfaction. 10 out of the 20 were satisfied. You did 10 divided by 20, you get a P out of 0.5. You plug that into here, you get a Z score of, I forgot to write Z is equal to, Z is equal to, which I already did for you, negative 3.354. And so 50% is way below, far out here, and negative 3.34 is way far out here. That's really strong evidence to reject, so. Okay, so you can just look compared to the critical value. So the idea again is um, we expect 80% satisfaction. If we get a P out of 80, perfect. We believe them because it's exactly what they claimed. If we get 75, eh, it seems reasonable. We still give them the benefit of the doubt. 70, we're starting to be skeptical, but we still give them the benefit of the doubt. Uh, 60, nah, we're calling them out. We're going to sue them. And 50%, oh, hell no, they're definitely lying. So that's the idea. The further out it is from what we expect um, their claim, the more evidence we have that they are lying and that the true percentage of satisfied customers is below their claim of 80%. That's the idea here, and that's it for 9.1. You're ready to tackle the problems, um, and then you can start to do 9.2. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rush to get that up as well because we've done most of 9.2. The only thing I want to do in addition is do different significance levels other than 5%. Do two tail tests and right tail, which we haven't done because these were all left tailed, and then do some errors. Talk about the errors that I mentioned. So that's got to be fleshed out in 9.2. All right. Yeah, I lied. Uh, I didn't like the way it was. I ended it. Uh, I want to summarize. So just to organize it and to just summarize what we did. Okay. So. Um, these are the p hats. The distribution is the same for the sample of 20, and these are the four results we worked with. Um, and if we looked at the z score and the standard normal curve, they'd be th four identical um, pictures to that, other than the labeling would be z scores and it'd be n01, but same idea. And so um, our first sample of 20, and they're all samples of 20, got 75% um, satisfaction. That's close enough to the 80. It's below, but it's close enough that we sus we are, we're okay with it. And we believe them. We give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, there's a 29% chance of us getting that result by random chance. Seems reasonable. 70%, um, we did not work out the p-value, but I did it. Um, instead, I used the um, cutoff critical value, and we decided we were not going to reject in that situation. But the p-value turned out to be 13%, and that's why, because 70% um, is still close enough. It's starting to get a little bit iffy. 60%, when we did that one, we did a p-value of 0 0.013. And because it's below 5%, we rejected. So that's too far below where we start to suspect um, their customer satisfaction rate is not what they claim. It's, it's we, we think it's lower. And then the last one, 50%, we didn't actually work that one out um, the whole way out. We didn't even get a p-value. We just decided we're going to reject based on the critical value. But if we did do a p-value, it'd be 0 0.0004. So that's the idea. Um, we don't reject because there's a 29% chance of that happening by random chance. 70% we don't reject because there's a 13% chance of that occurring by random chance. We reject because that's 1% chance of that happening. And we definitely reject because there's a practically 0% chance of that happening. So this is me getting zero aces, perfectly reasonable. Me getting one ace, eh, still reasonable. Me getting three aces was already suspicious and we rejected and you didn't believe my red deck was legit. And this is me getting five aces out of five draws, which is definitely not something that can happen by random chance. I mean, technically it could, but realistically it's a 0% chance of that occurring. So don't reject, fine, don't reject, reject and definitely reject. So that's the idea behind p-values giving us or leading us to a conclusion about whether we believe their distribution. Um, that's it.